the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And by the Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey, the National Oil Heat Research Alliance and BioHeat, the evolution of oil heat. Promotional support is provided by Observer New Jersey Politics, a destination for statewide political news. We're here to celebrate the life and career of a remarkable man. I'm Michael Aaron. Brendan Byrne died this past Thursday at the age of 93. He was governor of New Jersey from 1974 to 1982. His legacy is all around us. Here to help us remember him properly are four people who knew him well. Tom Kane succeeded Brendan Byrne as governor and counted him as a close friend. Kent Manahan was producer and host of the Kane Byrne Dialogue on public television that she created more than 25 years ago. John Degnan was Byrne's chief counsel in the governor's office and later attorney general. <clears throat> and Jim Zazali succeeded Degnan as attorney general under Byrne and would later go on to be chief justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court. Welcome, everybody, on this sad occasion. Governor Kane, what are your thoughts about Brendan Byrne today? Well, he was a giant. You know, he was, if we look at New Jersey governors, he'll go down in history as one of the best. And, and he left things, you know, as governor, you like to think, there are things that might not have happened if you wouldn't been there. There are a lot of them with Brendan, and important ones. This would be a different state without the Pinelands. This would be a different state without casino gambling. Just taking those two alone, that would not have happened. Without anybody else been governor, they would not have happened. I can guarantee it. Kent Manahan, what are your thoughts at this moment? I think of public service. He was the epitome of a man who loved the people of New Jersey and wanted so much to give back to the people of New Jersey that he was kind of plucked out of nowhere to run for governor uh, in, uh, when he won uh, and wasn't expected to and put himself wholly into the job to serve the people of this state. He was a true public servant. He took it seriously. He studied the issues. Um, he believed in what he believed in and went out to fight for what he thought was right. He was a true public servant. John Dagnan, how are you feeling today? You're the one here who worked with him virtually every day in the same office, I believe. Uh, for about seven and a half of the eight years or so, Michael, I, uh, what I'm feeling today is the world needs the example of the Brendan Burns at a time when our public discourse has deteriorated into anger and name calling and ignorance. Brendan stands out in contrast as someone who took firm positions argued persuasively for them, deflected anger with humor, never engaged in name-calling or recriminations, and got things done. And, and that's the kind of example politicians today need to follow. Jim Zazali, how are you feeling today? Uh, echoing John and following John, it occurs to me I'm constantly following John. I follow him as attorney general. I'm following him now. Hopefully, I won't, well, we won't go into any other followings. <laughs> uh, but, it occurred to me that the legacy is many things, of course, all his individual accomplishments, which were extraordinary. But globally, I'd like to look at his legacy as the word John just used, as his example. The example that he said and the leadership that he provided, particularly the example when it came to his intellectual integrity and intellectual honesty, a little bit of a difference there, his personal integrity, and uh, his sheer unvarnished courage. And we saw that in so many ways, very ranging as we all know from his uh, willingness, to, willingness to take on the income tax. John and others can tell you better than I how during his eight years, he would say uh, a politician should be ready to uh, lose an election for at least one issue. And it was a, a, a tremendous character builder, obviously. But he, uh, it is that legacy that we saw not just in the tax, income tax, but in terms of uh, the sports complex, we maybe can get into that a little bit, taking on the New York establishment to make sure that the sports complex succeeded, and on and on and on. Let me, before we continue and try to flesh out the legacy, let me ask you each, 
how you, what, what your relationship with him was, starting with you, Jim. Well, interesting. I guess my relationship started when he appointed me an, an assistant prosecutor back in 1965. In Essex 53 County. Three years ago. And, it's, and I did not want to do that. I wanted to join my dad in the practice of law. I was 27 years old. Judge Whipple, for whom I clerked, urged me to uh, be an assistant prosecutor. Next thing I know, I was getting an a, a call from Brendan Burns' secretary to come up for an, an interview. So I went up there, and for 15 minutes, he sat there, never looked at me in the eye, but was bent over, shining his loafers. Uh, and that's all he did. He asked me questions, but never looked me straight in the eye. I don't even think he said hello. And at the end of the 15 minutes... Was that peculiar? I mean, well, no, that, what was peculiar was his uh, first and last remarks. He looked up after 15 minutes of shining his shoes and said, all right, you're hired, but it'll be a risk. Uh, <laughs> I was ready to walk out. I, I really was and say, take your job and et cetera. But uh, that would have been a mistake, I think. <laughs> John Dignan, how did you come together with Brendan Byrne? And were you there for the first campaign in 1973? Well, let me, let me point out, he never shined his shoes when I was there, but by that time he had graduated to white bucks and red socks, so <laughs> he didn't right. have to shine. And striped suits. And striped suits. Um, I knew Michael because we both grew up in West Orange. He's 20 years older than I am, but our fathers were friends and political allies, and Brendan was the Irish Catholic kid from West Orange who went to Princeton and Harvard and was sort of the paragon of what you could accomplish. So I always had my eye on him as an example I only learned later when I got to work with him and saw his integrity and his, Jim referred to his intellectual curiosity and how bright he was and how determined he was. Then I realized what a great example he really was and he's been an example for me for my whole life. How about you, Kent, uh, your relationship with Brendan? Well, I never covered Brendan because I was not quite in the business yet of reporting during his first term in office. but. In his second term, I did. Um, not a lot, but I had occasion to meet him and to observe him, of course, in office and the kind of leadership he provided as, as governor. And the story goes, one morning over a cup of coffee in our kitchen, my husband and I were talking about Tom Kane and Brendan Byrne um, and as leaders and chief executives and friends, governors who remained friends. And the thought came, to us that wouldn't it be interesting for these two governors to sit down and talk to the people of New Jersey about current issues and give their perspective. So with the encouragement of my news director, William Jobes, back at New Jersey Network in those days, he said, go ahead for it. So I did. I called Brendan first um, because he was out of office longer than you, Governor Kane, and kind of talked him into it and said, well, if Tom Kane will do it, I'll think about doing it too. So we met after I called you at Drew University in your yep. office. Yep. You were then um, the uh, president of the university, and we came together. And I didn't quite convince you that day to do it. But you said, both of you, you think about it. And you did. And about two days later, I followed up with phone calls. And you said you would come and give your perspective on New Jersey Network News at that time, 27 years ago. Wow. So we started it then. It continues today as governor's perspectives. And you know, it, it was the foundation of these two governors, Brendan Byrne and Tom Kane, their friendship, their perspective, and their knowledge of the issues that really impact people's lives in this state. And we're still going strong today, not with Brendan now, of course, yeah. and not so much in the last couple of years. But we often talk about him when we we're do. off camera, don't we, Governor? We do, all the time. <laughs> Governor, you were famously close with Brendan Byrne. How did that evolve? Well, involved looking at today's politics in a very strange way. I, I'd known Brendan. I was from Livingston. He was from West Orange. He was a friend of my older brother's. So I knew him, but not well. Then I was the Republican leader in the state assembly. He was the governor. And so we went at each other, as minority leaders and governors do, and uh, argued. We, it, was, it was the beginning of an argument that went on for 45 years, <laughs> but <laughs> a lot of it in public. But uh, we became friends in the process. And we would disagree and, and about things, and he'd take them and nod and say, all right. And, uh, and so after he became governor and I was elected, uh, he and I had a relationship. This is the first time I've talked about this, I think. Uh, 
I was a new governor, Republican, with a totally Democratic legislature who wasn't sure they trusted me or not. And so I had a lot of difficulty my first six or eight months working with the legislature. What nobody knew was after I finished in the office, at least once a week, I would go and meet Brendan Byrne for a tennis game. Where? Uh, well, we'd play at Morven very often. Not Morven, yeah. Is it drum court, drum still, no, no, not drum court, yeah, but it was still a court at Morven in those days, I think. And, uh, but we played there, wherever. But anyway, some play, somewhere. After work, work, you'd have a tennis work, game. After work, and I'd, I'd meet Brendan, we'd play. And then I'd say, Brendan, let me ask you about this legislature. I think he's very odd, but I can't reach him, and he's a problem for me. What should I do? And Brendan would say, yeah, well, you know, his best friend is someone. If you could reach out to him, or oh, this is what's important in his district, and maybe you could do that. And he educated me day by day, week by week, year by year on members of the Democratic legislature and how to deal with them. And he was uh, absolutely invaluable. And I kept him as a close advisor all the way through my governorship. I, I talked to him all the time and got his perspective on what was going on. We didn't, again, we disagreed as we often disagreed, but his perspective was invaluable and he, that, was the, that was where our friendship got really cemented. And then went on. I, I pointed, uh, he appointed me to the highway authority when he was, I appointed him to the ports authority, in spite of the fact Republicans and Democrats wanted that position. But, but uh, you know, we, we, we developed a, a close relationship out of starting out of political enmity in different parties. And it's something that I'd love to see happen today. I don't know if I ever could again, but. As you all know, <clears throat> after he left the governorship, Brendan Byrne developed a second act. Uh, as a stand-up comic, as an after-dinner speaker, uh, we have a number of clips of him giving some remarks. Uh, we're going to play them throughout this hour. We're going to start with his remarks at a Legislative Correspondence Club dinner. Let's hear it. Uh, Frank Lautenberg went for his nap <laughs> already. I've, believe it or not, I have been coming to this off and on for 50 years. Uh, uh, so I knew all the words to the songs. <laughs> no, no, nothing, nothing has changed much. Anyway, uh, although I'm not used to having a reception like this. Everybody forgets how unpopular I was in the good old days. <laughs> Remember the poll that showed that 96% of the people in New Jersey knew who I was, and 4% thought I was doing a good job? Uh, anyway, this is a nicer climate. Now, somebody asked me at the cocktail, what's the best, in 50 years, what's the best line you ever heard? at a uh, legislative correspondence show. And I think the best line was, was a few years ago when a horse called Hudson County finished second in the Kentucky Derby. Anybody remember that? And old Joe Sullivan, the Hudson County guy, explained that he was supposed to finish second. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I still like that. I still like. It. People ask me what I'm, what I'm. I mean, Lomberg went for his nap. Uh, people ask me what I am doing these days. And the truth is, uh, I'm doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> and I don't start doing it until 11 o'clock <laughs> in the morning. But it's. Uh, but it's nice. It's nice. That, you know, I still regard myself as a product of, of Hudson County. And I still say that I want to be buried in Hudson County so I can remain active in politics. <laughs> uh, I, just, I just like Hudson County. Hudson County says it all for me. Yeah. You know, a Hudson County politician. It's a guy who was born poor but honest and spends a lifetime 
overcoming those handicaps. <laughs> I, 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 I've been worried a little bit. I've been worried a little bit that Monmouth County is trying to surpass. <laughs> Hudson County, but it, it just can't, it's not the same. <laughs> I mean, Joe Azzolino brought me from his store two boxes of Fig Newtons tonight. <laughs> that's, that's his big league. As... <laughs> um, can you imagine that? Somebody in, in Monmouth County sending somebody to the funeral parlor to see if Paul Byrne is really dead because <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Incidentally, I am not was not related to Paul Byrne. No, not even by check. And the Hudson County story would not work in Monmouth County. Please, Mr. Christie here, uh, no. go back to Hudson County. It's, it's, it's more fun. I mean, can you imagine? You've all heard the story that Dick Hughes used to tell about Barney Doyle, who was no hanger-on and always looking for a job. And they finally, Hughes gave him a job as superintendent of weights and measures. And at the press conference, they asked him, Barney, how many ounces in a pound? And he said, give me a break, I just got this job. <laughs> Not... <laughs> Not... <laughs> can, can you imagine trying to make that joke work in Monmouth County? <laughs> No. Lifeguards, nah. Uh, well, but, but frankly, Hudson County is changing. They, they're, they're adopting business methods, becoming professional, and using business techniques. You know, businessmen have deferred compensation. Hudson County has deferred compensation. <laughs> Call it what you will, it's deferred compensation. Regrets or not. Uh, but, and, and Hudson County is becoming more open. I mean, there's no secrets anymore. They've added, they've got an attitude of open government in Hudson County. Everything is, they're not hiding anything. I think the mayor of Jersey City took it a little too far. <laughs> when he stepped out on the front porch, but <laughs> there we go. So anyway, so all, Ruthie and I are just hanging around. We don't do anything any, anymore. We listen to you guys. But Don Payne told me a great story about, about how to have a perfect marriage. When you're married 25 years, you take her to Hawaii, and when you're married 50 years, you go down and pick her up. Uh, uh, anyway. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been coming for these for 50 years. And you know, frankly, this is a great group. This is a group of people who are in the arena. These are people that some, some years you come here, it's all Democrats. Some years it's all Republicans. You know, we get wiped out or we come back. And, and, and there's something fun about that. And there's something that gets you involved. Who was it? Uh, Theodore Roosevelt said they didn't want to be counted among those timid souls who know neither the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. It's all here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> John Dagnan, uh, was he that funny as governor? Every day. Was um, he? 
I, I, I still get laughs telling the jokes I remember <laughs> him having told. But he also used it to a great advantage. There was, he loved his children. Till the day he died, he loved his kids. One daughter, Susan, who sadly has passed away, wrecked at least two or three state cars while he was governor. He was widely criticized for allowing her to use a state car. He went to the Legislative Correspondents Club dinner, took the helicopter, and opened his speech by saying, you know, I came here tonight by helicopter. I had to. There were no state cars left. <laughs> the place erupted in laughter, and it diffused an issue that was used, being used by his enemies against him. So he, he used humor tactically, but he did it very naturally. What other memories do you all want to share? Well, well, you know, he could be tough also. He could be funny. He could be tough in politics. I remember one story told me how uh, a fellow called Kerry, who was the Democratic chairman of Essex County, called him one day. And he had a rough campaign for re-election. All the Democrats did it for him. There was this one guy from West Orange who written this really nasty letter about him and put it in the newspaper. And sure enough, Kerry's nominating this fellow for a position. And Brennan has scratched off his name. Kerry says, calls Brendan and says, you know, he's a good Democrat. How could you scratch him off the list? <laughs> Brendan says, you see that letter he wrote about me? And Kerry said, yeah, but that was just politics. And Brendan said, so's this. <laughs> <laughs> was he a good politician? Can I tell you a memory? Of Michael, course. Looking at that tape and those legislative correspondence dinners, you and I attended so many of them, and we would often see Brendan writing on a napkin some of the lines that he was going to deliver to the audience when he stood up at the microphone. And I just remember marveling at that. Now, obviously, that was a prepared speech for, for that, those remarks, but prepared by Brendan Byrne, who probably spent hours and hours on it. One of the things he would tell a story about was the closet in his and Ruthie's home in Essex County, where he kept the jackets. Everybody gave him a jacket, no matter where he went, a hat and a jacket. And he had one closet, and it became two closets, and became three closets until Ruthie was threatening to throw <laughs> them all away because they were taking up the whole house. But this man could make a joke out of things like that. And in fact, about you, Governor Kane, and governor's perspectives, he would say, Kent, you have continued to make me famous in New Jersey, <laughs> he would say. You know, because of this program, let, just quickly I'll say, because of the governor's program. And he'd say, you know, I walk along the street these days and people come up to me and they say, I know you. You're Governor Kane. <laughs> <laughs> that have, was Brendan. I just have one that was to that. He said, he told me one time this guy came up and said, and said you're Governor Kane. <laughs> and he said, no, Kane. And walked on. <laughs> but his wit was, excuse me, John, the, the wit was, of course, a major aspect of his wonderful personality, but there were so many other deeper parts to him and about him. I don't want to use the overworked phrase, Renaissance man, but he was close to, as all these folks know, with his interest in opera, in poetry, in great- the I mean, Theater. Uh, theater. Theater. The London Theater he used um, to go to. And he knew the sport, whether it was a basketball uh, a score or a baseball average, he could come up with all that information. And I think, and Governor Kane, you had this in common, as I understand it. Brendan always was proud of the fact that he had four or five open books on his night table at night, history and biography, and he said you were the same, uh, built uh, the same way. And I think that that's This while being governor of the state and raising seven children. <laughs> and somehow, but he read them. I mean, uh -huh. he, he would read the yeah. books that, that uh, were worthwhile, starting with, uh, I can remember in 1977, it's funny how you remember things, he read the... Uh, new biography of Thomas Moore, yeah. and uh, uh, by, I think it was Richard Marius. But long story short, that was a class, is a classic. And I think he read it for a couple of reasons. I mean, they had uh, a bit in common, both extraordinarily principled, committed to doing the right thing, whatever the risk. In the case of Moore, of course, it meant his life. In the case of Brendan, it could have meant an election. I mean, there were none of them, none of us are perfect, but uh, if they weren't, especially Brendan, a man for all seasons, he was a man for most seasons. You know, Michael, you asked if he was a good politician, and I, I think he was a great leader. He was a brilliant governor. Politics was what he had to do to get there, I think. He didn't enjoy the art of politics in and of itself. He 
politics was an, an enabler for him to make its contributions. One point I would make, you have this great picture of him behind you there. I think it was the day after he won re-election, but he's listing. Uh -huh. he, 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 he wanted to hear what you had to say. He, and he'd re, he rejoined, we have rejoinders for you. He never totally agreed with you, but he was engaged in the process of both learning and, and teaching. But you know, learning and then acting, to talk about books, I don't, his major accomplishment may have been the Pinelands. I mean, it changed the state. He thought it was, he yeah. said it was. Well, I, I agree with him, and I, I think it really was. And, and the, but if you think about it, that accomplishment came because he read a book. It wasn't because somebody talked to him. It wasn't because people, politicians pressed for it, or even environmentalists pressed for it. He read a book. John McPhee's, John McPhee's The book, Pine Barrens. The, the Pine Barrens. And he said, this is so important, we have to preserve it for the future. And he established the largest open space between Boston and Atlanta out of, out of a book. I mean, I can't think of another political leader who had an idea from a book <laughs> and made it into policy like that. And he did claim that as his greatest achievement. In, in 2010, when we did the documentary, we were producing it called The Power of the Governor, uh, which aired uh, about a year and a half later, talking to numerous governors, including you, Governor Kane. Um, Brendan Byrne, in his segment, that was pro a pro documentary produced by a former NJN colleague of ours, Bob Zuder, Michael, um, when he was interviewed, he said, you know, I." This was stumbling in the legislature. No one was backing me up on the preservation of a million acres in South 20 percent of the land mass of New Jersey. And he believed in it so and fought for it so. And finally, understanding the full capacity of the power of the office of governor of New Jersey made the Pinelands Act happen through executive order. And that's how it was accomplished. And Jim Florio end. passed companion legislation in the federal government. Yes, that's right. John, you wanted to jump in? No, I remember that vividly because I was then, uh, I think, attorney general, and I told him it was unconstitutional, his executive order. And he said, well, I don't agree with you. I'm going to sign it and go argue in favor of it in the Supreme Court, which I did. Um, but ultimately, his <laughs> signing the order, Kent, and you've got a great memory about that, was what precipitated the legislature passing a bill uh, which was a little less draconian than his order was, but was all he wanted in the end. It was a brilliant strategic move on his part to force them to act. Let, Jim? Um, no question that he felt that Pine Barrens and all the critics and commentators would agree was probably his primary success. But he would say, and I think John would confirm this, that he was so proud of the and, and most proud, he would say, of the hundreds of qualified people that he brought into government. And the interesting part of that, as I was thinking about it today, that did not start with his being governor, because when he was the prosecutor, he had achieved such a wonderful reputation statewide and nationally that there were assistant United States attorneys leaving the U.S. Attorney's Office in the 60s not quite in droves, but in substantial numbers, to go to work for Brendan Byrne. That's unheard of. It just doesn't happen that way. But that's the kind of magnetism he had in the reputation. And they were acquired. such quality in general that when I came following as a Republican, I kept them because they were good men and women. I mean, they were decent people who weren't there for politics. They were there to do the right thing. And, and uh, so we had sort of a continuous... 16 years with a lot of those people who stayed through both administrations. Let, well, you didn't hear, keep me, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's hear another... There's a reason, there's a reason for No that. hard feelings. <laughs> let's hear another selection from his speeches, this one before a group called Lawyers for the Arts in Newark some years back. Ladies and gentlemen, I, thank you. I was... Out at the cocktail party a little while ago, some, somebody stuck a microphone in my face and asked me what my talent is. For 50 years, I've been getting away without talent. Why do they start asking me now? Well, but there's hope for us. There's hope for us, old guy. I mean, this guy 87 years old, won an election in New York yesterday. Immediately, Frank Lautenberg started his campaign for re-election. <laughs> uh, so, 
So it's nice, it's nice to be here. I, I guess I'm here because I'm the only guy who remembers Fordville <laughs> before, it, before it got killed the last time. Uh, no, it's fun seeing I, I saw I saw Stuart Pollock outside. You remember him? Used to be used to be a judge. We were we were we were together in Morris County for a while. There was a there was a judge by the name of Scotty Long, and he had long flowing hair, and he liked to wander around the corridors in his in his robe, looking very uh, impressive. And one day, uh, some little kid looked up at him and said, "Are you God?" And Scotty said, "No." Son, but that was a damn good guess. Anyway, it says in my notes, uh, 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 Ruthie, where's page 10? <laughs> And Ruthie wouldn't let me wear my baggy pants. Uh, anyway, uh, I did know Joe Smith of Smith and Dale, and we used to exchange stories. Uh, he was a prototype for, for uh, the Sunshine Boys. And uh, whatever stories he told me about vaudeville days, something funnier was happening in New Jersey every one of those times. <laughs> I mean, for only in New Jersey. Uh, I, we were talking about the time that the old Irish cop in Newark found a dead horse on Freeland Heights and Avenue and dragged it to Broad Street because he couldn't spell Freeland Heights. <laughs> Jersey, uh, the, the, the lady, uh, the lady who uh, was arrested for operating a disorderly house, and she was sentenced to community service. <laughs> and she said that she thought that's what she had been doing. <laughs> but this goes back. I mean. Uh, this, this goes back a long way in New Jersey. Uh, I told you, uh, William Franklin was our first governor, and he was things like a cross-dresser. Now, this is, I'm talking about William Franklin now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I reminded you that, I reminded you that he was Benjamin Franklin's son, albeit illegitimate son. And I learned from that, uh, a lot easier to be governor if you're a bastard right from the beginning. Uh, uh, and, and, and New Jersey is famous for, for politicians who are born poor but honest and spend a lifetime overcoming those handicaps. <laughs> We do things like that. Uh, anyway, I used to I used to talk to to uh, Smith and Dale, at least Smith. And as I say, New Jersey just happens to be funnier uh, than anybody. And so, uh, oh, well, let me just close with one observation, it's just to show you this happens all the time in New Jersey. There was one time an argument in the city council in Newark. And it came, one of the citizens stood up and said, I understand we sell water to the city of Elizabeth cheaper than we sell it to our own citizens in Newark. And Councilman Bontempo said, yeah, but the water we sell to Elizabeth is diluted. <laughs> Uh, back on a serious note for a second, here are some of the things that Brendan Byrne did.
did uh, <clears throat> saved the pine lands, created New Jersey Transit, uh, instituted a state income tax in an effort to uh, stave off property tax growth, uh, helped build the Meadowlands, helped bring casino gambling to Atlantic City, rewrote the criminal code, uh, created public financing of gubernatorial elections, created the Office of Public Advocate that would later be killed. Uh, that's quite a legacy. I, you have a legacy that matches that, but not many other governors do. Um, am I missing anything here? No? What, what's missing really, it's not missing really because we've been talking about it, but you know, he was so thoroughly decent. And a combination of a successful politician who's also decent, unfortunately, is very rare and should be treasured, as we treasured Brendan Byrne. Well, Governor Kane, you said before in, in your remarks about um, how determined he was, and that was Brendan Byrne, the Brendan that, that we know. And going back to the beginning, a memory of mine is watching Brendan Byrne, um, who was facing a tough re-election bid in 1977, 17% ratings in the polls. The odds against him were stacked for re-election after the passage of the income tax. And I remember watching some of the debates because there were numerous ones between him um, and Ray Bateman, um, who they became friends afterwards. Of course, Brendan went on to win that election. But watching the debates, Brendan would come in to the studio where the debate was going to be held, and he'd bring a binder with him just like the litigator, the prosecutor that he had been. He was prepared with every issue. He would walk in, go to the podium, and put that book in place in front of him. And he would know every issue, every person affected, every dollar that it took to run each department of government, how many people were served out of those departments. He was equipped with all the facts and prepared to win that election. He did. And he also won the great respect of Ray Bateman, and thus they became friends ever after. At that point, <clears throat> when he was deciding whether to run for re-election, he, he was known as one-term burn. And John Dagnan, I believe it was you who talked him into running. Uh, that's, at least that's part of the legend, that around January or February of that year, most of his advisors were ready to throw in the towel, and that he was thinking about that. Is that a true story? Most of his advisors had left. I was young enough to stick <laughs> around. I didn't have a job to go to. Um, the governor, went, after he was reelected at this improbable victory at his press conference, one moment in his life and mine, I'll always remember, said he wanted the world to know there were two people in his life who urged him to run for reelection: Gene Byrne. His John first Degnan. wife of 40 years. That's right, and John Degnan. And, and that afternoon, I asked him if I could be attorney general, and he said, no, I was too young. Um, but it took me three weeks to persuade him. You were in your early, you were in your early 30s at the time. I, I, I was. Uh, to, the, to your earlier question, to, to me, Governor, he was the model of what public service should be and why one should be a public servant, just as you are. From his days in the military to his service on the Public Utility Commission to being a great judge and a brilliant governor, he never got rich. He never did it to self-aggrandize. He did it to serve the public. And we need more of those kinds of policies. He was a very modest guy at heart, wasn't he? A very what? Modest man at heart. No? I, I wouldn't call him modest. I think he had a proper appreciation for his intellect and his skills. But he, he was not full of himself. He was not a braggart. He wasn't, uh, uh, he wasn't that kind of human being. He had seven children to keep him in yeah, place right. at home. That's right. Jim Dizali, uh, he's a governor whose uh, acolytes and, and staffers <coughs> would periodically get together for reunions still to this day. Have you been part of that? Sure, many of us. John was there. and there, we used to have, you, Governor Kane wouldn't make it. Yeah. He would have 40 or 50, 60 people there at the old palace cabin or whatever, and they were great tributes. Uh, He'd ask everyone to get up and speak, and that was uh, interesting to see how folks reacted. But I, I think, you know, we talked about his, uh, his decency. I think in the earlier years that I knew him in the prosecutor's office, 
you knew he was a decent man, but you never realized how warm and affectionate he could be, and indeed uh, emotional. I think we all saw yeah. that. Didn't realize it when he was prosecutor, and I certainly didn't see that much of it as when he was governor. John may have. But I ask a question of the others. You recall that he, is, he had said once or twice that he enjoyed being the prosecutor more than he enjoyed being governor. I never knew the answer to that question as to why he felt that way. Any of you have any thoughts? I know he loved that position. He loved the people in the office who were in the office with him, which you were one of them, I guess. And uh, he, was always, he was always a law enforcement guy at heart, I think, wouldn't you say? And he, he always enjoyed that part of the, part of the governor's job. He would the say major... that that was the best job. You're right, Jim. He would say that was the best job I ever had. And he took that job so seriously that, and John, you can attest to this, that he would appoint, he would look at candidates for judgeships and prosecutors, um, which New Jersey governors do. Not all states, very few states do that, where the governor has the authority and the power to appoint judges and prosecutors. He would invite those candidates in for face-to-face, one-on-one meetings with him in his office. Interviews. He interviewed he everyone. Every single one. Of I them. have a slightly different recollection of that, though. I once asked him, Governor, which of all the jobs you had did you enjoy the most? And he gave me a very smart answer. He said, you know, at the point in my life when I was doing the job, that was the best job for me. Mm. When I was young and aggressive and assertive, being a prosecutor was right. As I got older and wanted to be more reflective and, and learn my way into the system, the Public Utilities Commission was great and being a judge was great and then being governor was the epitome. Uh, he had relationships with certain celebrities. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have that clip of him boxing with Muhammad Ali. Uh, I hope we can call that up. Okay, let's take a look. Shoot Ali in his corner now. He was pretty athletic. <laughs> oh, he was, he was very athletic. Now, he, he, and I, he and I were tennis players together for, uh, God, I guess about 15 years. And um, Who won? Uh, we, we often played doubles together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John Degnan, what other celebrities did he cultivate or did they cultivate him? Do you recall? Uh, he was very close to Celeste Holm, um, lots of sports figures. Um, he, he enjoyed anybody who would enliven the, the scene, you know, with whom he could engage in a, you know, in a fun exchange. He, you know, he was a serious and determined man, but he had fun <laughs> being he, governor. He, you know, we both had a very close relationship with Yogi Berra. Oh. Yeah, the, of Montclair. The, yeah, we'd go, out to, we'd go out to lunch together once or twice a year, uh, Brendan and myself, Ruthie, Yogi, my son often read, and uh, we had fun. <laughs> we had great fun. Um... What else? More memories. Oh, God. You, there's, there's so many of them that come flooding back. You, know, you were talking about the campaign. Uh, what people forget in that campaign was he was still behind, and he kept, he kept ch challenging his opponent to find out how he was going to pay for his not having an income tax. So finally, Ray Bateman's opponent got together a list of things. Ray Bateman was the opponent. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Brendan, Brendan's yes. opponent, Ray yeah. Bateman. Brendan's opponent was Ray. Yeah. yeah. So Ray got together this list of things he was going to balance the budget with. Put it out, and then he wanted validity to it. So we got the former Secretary of the Treasury, Bill Simon, to vouch for it. So the two of them did a press conference, and here's the sign plan for Simon and Bateman. And uh, Brendan got it, looked at it, and said, Yeah, this is a BS plan. <laughs> <laughs>
that caught, I think that caught on, uh, that, that, yeah. that line. I think that helped propel well, that was, him. That was the, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a credible plan from that moment forward. And in his first campaign for, uh, for governor in 73, uh, he was helped by a, a FBI wiretap that caught one mobster saying to another mobster uh, w that uh, Judge Byrne can't be bought, and he ran on the slogan, the man who couldn't be bought. Yeah. Uh, I, I think both that and the BS plan uh, helped carry him to victory in those two elections. You know, Mike, you have to remember, it was post-Watergate when he ran for governor, and the country was clamoring for an honest, decent politician, and it was his moment in time. And the, the coincidence of that quote uh, and the, the, the passion in and the And plus, Charlie Sandman, the Republican who ran against him that year, was a Nixon supporter. Right uh, to the end. Right, right to the, the right to the end. Yeah, right. and had defeated in the primary a great Republican governor, Bill Cahill. We have one more clip we want to get into this program, so let's go to it. A lot of lot of people here. I wish I could name. I wish I could name because I do know all of them. Except one guy came up, and I heard him. I heard him walking away and said, I think he's lost a little. <laughs> he's, he's a, he didn't even remember my name. <laughs> and, and, and maybe he's gonna, the truth is, I never did know that guy. <laughs> But there are, there are people here, and, and this is the, really a thrill for me, people here from my high school, from my college, from my law school classes, and, and the one thing they have in common is that they all got better grades <laughs> than, than I did. Well, you know, it doesn't bother me. Yeah? If it weren't for me, there wouldn't have been a top half of the class. <laughs> There's Tim. I remember when Tim was eight, he came home from school one day, had written a composition on where he wanted to go to college, and he had picked Yale, and I asked him why, and he said, because I could spell Yale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somehow I think that may be how we pick presidential candidates. <laughs> The, the both, yeah. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not that partisan. <laughs> no, I'm basically, you know, policy man. I'm an environmentalist. I'm for more trees and fewer bushes. <laughs> President Bush. President Bush. I was, I was about, Tom Kane said, that he didn't bring me a present. I thought he had, because I saw a used tennis ball out there. <laughs> anyway, uh, as I say, there are a lot of, I, I, I wouldn't dare single anybody out and say thank you, although, gee, every, every face I look at has helped me somewhere along the line, and, and I just want you to know each one of you, I appreciate it. I, uh, just to make, because it's relevant, I'm, I, I, I read a resume of me recently, and it mentioned everything but the Pinelands, which I think is what I'm going to be remembered mostly for. My inspiration, frankly, for the Pinelands effort 
was a book called The Pine Barrens, written by John McPhee. And I'm especially honored that John McPhee is here tonight. Uh, I, I was remembering my 50th birthday when, I don't think it was Dick Kelly, but some legislator introduced the resolution, introduced the resolution wishing me a happy birthday. We died in committee, but... <laughs> Well, I'm in pretty good shape. Uh, it's, it's, Ray Bateman is, I'm not mentioning that. Ray Bateman is here. Ray Bateman and I ran the last clean campaign ever run. In. And, when, and when people saw what you get when you run a clean campaign, there hasn't been another one since. Yeah. Kane, you had a coronation, it wasn't. <laughs> Incidentally, I, I, I'm proud to be a uh, delighted that my. I, so I have agreed. This is true. I have agreed on Monday to take a driver's test. Uh, and somebody asked me, "What happens if I flunk?" Uh, McGreevy's going to give me my helicopter back. <laughs> Anyway, I've been also asked if I had it to do all over again, would I do it any differently? Yeah. No. Faster, but not different. <laughs> Somebody referred to the bronze statue of me that's in the courthouse. Actually, uh, that was supposed to be Governor Christie but they didn't have en enough money to pay for all that bronze. <laughs> so, so I, I, I'm immortal. I, I've been immortal for a couple of years now. You know, I told many Brendan Byrne jokes at speaking engagements over the years <clears throat> you tell these w jokes word for word, and you don't get the kind of reaction he got. Half of it was in the delivery. Yes. Right? His timing, you know, they talk about Bob Hope's timing has been the best ever. Brendan was as good. I mean, <laughs> Brendan's timing was just, just right. When he told the story, it was let, great. Let me ask you each to sum up how we should remember Brendan Byrne, Jim Zizali. Remember, remember him as uh, certainly one of the state's great governors, right up there, remembering his legacy, and we've covered it all tonight from the individual today, from the individual accomplishments, to the broad concept of leadership and example, uh, remembering him, as Governor Kane said, as a, as a decent man, and the decency and the, and the goodness and the compassion and the concern for the public interest and the common weal that he demonstrated is really uh, an example, to repeat the word, that we all should be following. John Dagnan. So I'll, I'll remember him as a man of intellectual curiosity and a strong moral compass. I mean, he, he knew what he wanted to do in life, um, and he achieved all of it, and probably then some. Kent Manningham. I'll remember him as um, a governor who was not afraid to show his commitment to the issues that he believed in, um, and then to have the courage to go out and fight and fight and fight to get what he believed in done, and to do it all, which we've seen in this broadcast, with a sense of humor. That went a long way in making all of that happen. Brendan Byrne was a perfectionist at all of those skills. He did it very well. Tom Kane. He was tough, at the same time he was compassionate and decent, and uh, he's a lodestone in which we should look to when we try to elect public officials. We need them more now than ever. 
He was governor when I came to New Jersey in 1978. He hosted a reception at Morven uh, for New Jersey Monthly and me as its new editor. I've known him ever since. I've liked him a lot. And uh, I really appreciate you accepting our invitation to come in here, talk about him, listen to him, <laughs> and uh, we'll see you at the funeral. That concludes our, remember our remembrance of Brendan Byrne. As I think you've seen, he was a leader, a motivator, and a good guy. We'll miss him. For NJTV, I'm Michael Aaron. Thank you for being with us. Funding for this edition of On the Record with Michael Aaron was provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And by the Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey, the National Oil Heat Research Alliance and BioHeat, the evolution of oil heat. Promotional support is provided by Observer New Jersey Politics, a destination for statewide political news.